Hi, welcome to Termite Machine Works. My name is Keith. Uh, no, I'm not uh, cleaning house before company comes over. Um, I've had a request to do a, a video segment on uh, my drill press here. And uh, I took a little while to find some of my old photos. Uh, but uh, today I'm going to go ahead and take you through what had to be done to the machine to actually have it in its working state or the working state that I would classify as acceptable. Um, this is made in America um, and the phrase they don't make them like this anymore is because we don't grow machinists like we used to. I asked a, a mentor when I first started in the machine shop and I says, the guys that started all of this what kind of tolerances did they work with? And he looked at me and he said, they didn't have tolerances. They made it just right. That's where I said, I can do that. And that's what I held up to the best I can throughout my career. I picked this machine up for uh, about uh, $175. I think I paid for this machine. And um, to the owner's eyes, he, he thought it was operational. <laughs> but uh, um, I went ahead and, and I saw the potential in the machine and I needed a, a good sturdy um, drill press. Uh, before I lifted this head up on top of the machine here, I went ahead and re-poured the babbit in these bearings and took care of all the little things that had to be done, had to be fit with the comfort of being down on the ground uh, because it, it would have just been a nightmare to be up on a ladder uh, the whole time for the, the construction here. Here's a, a little slideshow presentation on the work that I did up on the upper head here uh, including the Babbitt pouring of those bearings before I lifted the whole thing up and uh, assembled that section. the Babbitt bearings uh, up here in the shaft I was able to get the head up here but there was a lot of other things uh, the the owner before me had uh, the old broken gear cog welded solid to the shaft and engaged he had no back gear capabilities in this at all so I manufactured a, a new gear cog out of a piece of cast iron and created the entire back gear shifting uh, capabilities back into this machine. These two covers here uh, were completely missing except for the two mounts and the original bolts holding the mounts on there. And I fabricated these um, 
in, in my own head what I thought they would look like in relationship to this one here wasn't harmed at all. This is beautiful. It was uh, uh, no damage to it at all. And I kind of looked at it and then I kind of just put two and two together with how that bracket was, was still there, broken off. And I kind of pictured the rest of these uh, in my mind. And I was astounded when I finally downloaded some pictures. And I had almost created exactly what they originally were looked like. One of these days I'll create a uh, copper tube situation here that will feed each and every one of these lubrication points. Come on down here, come to a manifold, and then have a one push plunger oiler system on here. Um, I'd have one right now. Those push plungers are uh, they're over a thousand bucks for uh, one that's uh, adequate enough to do the job. But I have a couple brake cylinders, master cylinders, and uh, I can create a reservoir and a spring-loaded pole handle and I can probably make one of those one of these days. I have the cylinder sitting there and I had the project just not on the uh, priority list right now. Here we're on the other side of the uh, head up here, and and uh, this kind of just so you could you get a chance to see from up above here uh, both sides of these shields that I had to make because they were missing off the top here. This area right here that was left with this piece right here. These two bolts are original, and it was broke off right there. And the other one was similar to the same same kind of mount. You can still see because I did. Uh, two process here. I created these in a silicon bronze weld the uh, the seams and shaped all that out and then I took and I brazed the cast piece to the steel in that fashion and some of the paint because of the flux I didn't get it 100% clean so you can see a little bit of where that break actually was but you know they're they're rigid they're strong. Alright I, I created a half a yoke there and a full circle yoke here uh, with pivot points to each of these rings one on the main shaft and one on the back gear shaft. As, as these two bypass each other, they got to come in and out and I have a slip joint, two tubes with a spring inside there so that when it bypasses each other, it under its own spring tension, it holds the gears engaged in both positions. There's a direct drive there and then sliding the lever over you disengage the direct drive and you engage these two gears here. This right here is an actual steering wheel out of a duck mobile or DUWK vessel from World War II. And uh, I put it on here so that I have a nice, nice speed wheel and I can control the head up and down. Lock it down where you need to lock it. 
This little slug coming out with the threaded holes is one of the pivot arms there for the original shift fork that used to shift the pulley position from drive to freewheel back and forth. The other mount is right here. So it had, it had a guide that was mounted here and it had a double finger slider. This is what they call a drive-all gearbox. Uh, drive-all manufacturing company is still in business. And as far as their website going, on the front it says established since 1940. So right around the 40s was uh, shortly following uh, the invention of electric motors. And this allowed a lot of shops to take and break their big machines all off of the individual lines and separate them into different rooms and different positions. Uh, it gave them universal location for the machine is what it did.